All right, good morning. Yeah, you can do better than that. So we're going to continue our lesson uh, talking about who we are and, and what we do and why we do it uh, along the areas of tradition, scripture, and personal preference. Uh, just so you know that topic development is ongoing, uh, I've received two others that we'll add into the list somewhere. One is gifts, uh, one is Bible classes, and we'll figure out where uh, those go in that list. It, so hopefully next week when we publish the new list. You can see it. So, welcome. Welcome back. If you're a continuing member of the class, if you're a visitor, welcome. Stay a while. Someone will come up and shake your hand. It's what we do. More statements? And the rest of the internet, no, no pressure uh, on who we are and how we do things. So, the question's important, and you've got to remember how it's phrased. Otherwise, we start defending things we either have no position on or never meant to defend. So, it's why, we, why don't we obey uh, the Old Testament food laws? So, remember the question. How about that? Remember our purpose. When we talk to people that ask us who we are and why we do the things we do as a body, these are the reasons and the answers. This topic falls under a broad heading of that generic subset of the law. Truly, that's the, that's the real question that's being asked. If someone asks you why we don't obey Old Testament food laws. Or, they've got a food law they want to force on you. It's one of two things. I don't mind people doing whatever they want to do, but I really mind people trying to tell me what to do. Maybe that just makes me an American, I don't know. But this topic is really about the law. However, we are going to talk about the law in an upcoming session. So in the interim, let's just go chase some food verses, okay? The topic is why we don't obey the Old Testament food laws. Where to go? As for you. <laughs> okay. So, let's chase some food scripture. Anybody got one? I got a few. I got a whole page of them. The Bible is pretty clear in the phrasing that it uses uh, for Cain and Abel. Uh, it's an offering. Uh, uh, uh. But what, why, and how uh, we, we eat in the Old Testament is a big deal. So who's got Genesis 7-2? You know, you, there's a book you got to bring, and you got to flip through it. That's all a part of school, right? You got to pretend to read along with the teacher. Humor me. Who's got Genesis 7-2? That's the ark, right? This is some thousands of years before the food laws. Now, who wrote Genesis? Moses. What's Moses also write for the Lord? The law. So, I will allow you to make the argument that there may be some backdating of information <laughs> as we move forward. Uh, but, uh, the Lord let it stand. And, and so, we're going to stand on it. And so Noah had some concept of what clean and unclean animals were. Because the Lord tells him there's a difference. And there's a difference in the number of each that are brought on the ark. A long time before the law. So what's Genesis 8.20?
All right. And so, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, so that's coming off the ark. And again, he sacrifices to the Lord, but he makes a distinction between clean and unclean animals. Then you got the law. Now, the law is huge. We're going to stay narrowly focused on the food portions of it. Down in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Now, you can read them. I mean, there's a, and there's a lot of words in them. It's uh, <clears throat> very hard to keep track of. I would have to pay someone to go grocery shopping with me and be like, no, not that. I, <clears throat> I love that. You know, in order to keep track of everything uh, that's covered in the law uh, that is both clean and unclean. So two chapters uh, in Scripture that, that are typically used uh, by Christians when we talk about food laws very narrowly, overly narrowly, I might add. One is, one is Acts 10. Everyone should f be familiar with that. That's, that's the kill and eat, the sheet coming down three times because Peter just don't get things the first time. And, and I have seen that used to justify that we are no longer under the Old Testament law food portion of it. It's not technically incorrect, but it is a party foul because you've got to read all of chapter 10. What does Peter immediately do with this information? He goes to Cornelius, because that's where he's set. And it is there, while he's talking to Cornelius, that he says, the Lord has just shown me that men are not clean or unclean. That's how Paul references this in the immediacy of the delivery of the message. This is within 72 hours-ish of the Lord giving him that vision. And that's how he immediately applies it. That's the direct application of it for Paul does Paul understand it later to come around and say we're not under the law and, uh, and we're not supposed to restrict ourselves and we don't have to live under that yoke he does so I'll allow you to use those verses that way but you've got to allow the greater context in which Peter uses them immediately because the Lord's trying to tell him two things at once. How does Peter deal with two bits of information at one time? Slowly. Yeah, very slowly, right? The guy processes like a typewriter compared to an iPhone. Not his fault. It's who he is. It's okay. Most of us are as, if not more, slow. So don't get feeling special. What about Romans chapter 14? Same problem. <clears throat> Who can give me context of Romans chapter 14 before I have to look it up for us all? Man, having one of these little things is great. Everybody should get one of these. Does everybody have a phone? All right. This is the part of, of Scripture about uh, strong Christians, weak Chris, Christians, that word wouldn't come out. Uh, and what, what, what we normally use uh, to make allowances for lack of knowledge, lack of maturity, lack of understanding of Scripture, uh, and then use that uh, against people. The food sacrificed to idols. And, and Paul saying, look, that stuff doesn't mean anything to me. Paul's much farther along in his maturity uh, than a lot of the Christ Christians he's dealing with. And they want to make rules for themselves so that they get it right. I understand it. I, I feel for them. But in the process, they're trying to make rules for everyone. And that's what Paul says no about. If you want to come alongside someone and do the stumbling block verses, those are personal. That's for you. You can choose to place yourself in that person's position and say, okay, for you, to help you, we will walk together and we will not do these things and I will be with you. 
The intent is always that that person matures and no longer needs you or that thing is a crutch and becomes a full-blown adult Christian. What Paul's trying to prevent is people making rules in the early church for everyone outside their control. And that's a lot of the discussion about food laws. At least half of them that I have with people in the world today is that they want their dietary preferences forced on me and they're attempting to bend scripture to force it. So be careful with that. What about all those? Who wants Romans 10 for? If you read, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, go ahead. Okay, so, so I, I got a prize for you because you drink coffee. I didn't give it to you because you don't drink coffee. It'd be wasted on you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little Brazilian coffee candy. It's going to make you froggy. All right, so give me that, that again. Okay. Who's got Galatians 3, 20, uh, 23 through 25? All right, Ephesians 2.10, 2.15. But you don't get a candy because you don't eat candy. (laughs) Unless they're wintergreen. Okay, we're going to come back to those verses in a couple of different lessons. These are the verses that that together help us explain the fulfillment of the law in Christ and what it means and what the outcome is. He lived it, he executed it perfectly, he fulfilled it, and he completed it. But what does all that mean? If you don't put them all together, I see people misconstrue that a lot. But he's the reason you're not bound by the law. And that argument is throughout the New Testament. In fact, a large part of the New Testament is that argument had in many different areas over many different topics. Areas being geographically in that statement. Because, the, you know, immediately upon introducing Christ to a part of the world, it seems as if the disciples were, were either immediately confronted by the Jewish population there or somehow a member of the Jewish community just popped up, boop, and he brought this big old book, and he's like, congratulations, all that, get after it. And, and Paul's like, desperately, no, none of that. So you've got to remember that. Who's got James 2.10? Go ahead, sir. Okay, so in any topic in which someone talks about us being bound by the law, bound being the key word there because the Bible does say you should know it because it's good information for everything God planned for you. And it is the source of wisdom and knowledge and understanding about God. But that, that's your reverse uno card. You're, you're not bound by the law. You're not bound by the law because you cannot keep it. You have no hope of keeping the law. You don't even know it, do you? Are you maybe going to Mark 12 at all? We are. Go ahead. Read it. Because I meant like, yeah, okay, because you want to. We're going there now. Let's go.
Okay, so for the audience out there, uh, Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 18 for discussion. No, no, that's fine, and thank you, uh, be, because I, I didn't pull that part in, because I can never get all of the discussion, so thank you for bringing that in. Uh, because what, what is important, in, in the context of those verses, and much of the New Testament, the key indicator of a person's strength of faith is their performance to the world at large. And so if someone wants to crack on you about what's going in, the answer is what comes out. Who am I? Because actions demonstrate heart, and heart is resolve, and actions have consequences. Wow, I got it right. <laughs> so, thanks. Um, so remember that. Um, and that can be used for, for a, I hate to say rebuttal, counter-battery fire, uh, because those are combative statements. Uh, but it can be used in the discussion we have with someone about the food laws. Uh, particularly if they're emotionally attached to a specific dietary process. Right. So did did everybody over there here wait? So I don't disagree, uh, but I, I, you would have to take a very circular path to get that into this discussion, because it, it really is just about the food laws. And, and you can say that the Lord made them for, uh, as a very early form of the FDA, uh, but I'm not sure it's relevant, uh, but, it, but it holds merit. Yeah, he was setting Israel apart. Right. Right. Not incorrect, but but now we're we're getting very circular in the discussion. So, I hope you all wrote that entirety of that discussion down, because there you go. If you get in that rabbit hole, there's your exit. And you can off-ramp yourself back to the discussion, so thank you. Yeah, that's not untrue, and, and we have to be very careful with that. Uh, that is it. What? <laughs> that is that is in the world and not of the world. Because what is your purpose? So we'll, I will I will go down this rabbit hole for forty five seconds or less. Your purpose is to be a light to others, to show them the example through how you live your life, not to be argumentative and rail at them for their decisions and choices. Just shine. We had an eight month discussion about that. 
If you get that twisted in any way, shape, or form, I get very upset with you because you are derailing God's work for you for your own purposes. Yes, ma'am. Maybe that'll help. That'll give you too many words if you eat it too fast. Yes. Write that down. Bring it back when we talk about the law in general. You're correct. Um, I think that that point belongs in that discussion uh, of the law in general. But you're not incorrect that there are people who will tell you that obeying the food law, you know, is pleasing to God. Because it pleased him then, it pleases him now. It's not a complete understanding of scripture. But I think that when we talk about why we don't live under the law in general, and you bring out those points, which are James' points, in his letter, we can, we can support that discussion. So that's when in Rome. So, yes, did you guys hear what the discussion is? If you are going somewhere and you are proselytizing, evangelizing, or preaching, and they have specific food requirements that they're going to be seriously offended by if you don't adhere to, go ahead and obey those local customs. And traditions. I have eaten lamb and rice out of a communal bowl with my hand with a bunch of other dirty hands going in it and, and was not offended. Um, just took an extra set of army issued <laughs> vitamins the next night. Um, that's when in Rome. It's okay to obey that then. At some point you get to speak to them about why, you know, you're, we're not required to be under the law portion of that if that's how they see it. Um, Peter makes a mistake in that in Scripture for us to see how not to apply it. When you know better and you're with an audience that knows better and you do it anyway, you're wrong. Everybody that was at that meal knew uh, that, that the, that Jewish community wasn't required to adhere to those laws and we're still... We're still rigidly adhering to for the wrong reasons, purposefully still trying to drag a tradition into you know, what was becoming the church. And, and Peter goes over there and he sits with them for personal comfort and whatever reasons. And, and, and Paul's like, dude, you as a leader can't do that. We have issue with between us now. So there are times where you can and can't. Just make sure you're making it, the decision consciously so that you're making the appropriate decision. So we always spend most of our time on Scripture. I think that's correct. Uh, but we'll move on to the second part of the discussion. So thank you for bringing in that, that part because that generated all of that discussion uh, right there. So what's your tradition? Remember who you are, where you come from. Now, that Scripture is pretty good. That's Paul telling Timothy the things that are going to come in the future where people try to make the church something other than it is, to fit their agenda. That's exactly what he says. Beware of these people who come and tell people what they can and cannot eat, what they can and cannot do, and what the rules are. And he tells Timothy to guard against that. And then we've been doing that for... 2,023 years-ish, minus 33, somewhere. So we have to be careful. How about that? Again, this is, this is your reverse UNO card. The law is big. You cannot be in part of it and not be in all of it. It doesn't work that way. There is no subset of the law that you can fulfill that satisfies all of the requirements of the law. It's, it's all or nothing. And be careful with that. 
because we don't have any history with it. Read it. What is it? Okay, Colossians 2.10. 2.14, thank you. I would, I would, I would only change one word in your sentence. Because we, we say did away with the law because we understand that in this room. When you're talking to an outside audience, you might want to uh, build a better framework for them. He came to complete and fulfill. Because you're going to need those words later in their vocabulary for further discussions about the law. Did away with uh, has implications that we don't mean. Because we still read it. It's still in scripture. The Bible says everything in there is good for edification. And it still gives us uh, an avenue to learn about God. Imagine if all of Proverbs were gone and we lost all that wisdom. And we had to relearn it every generation. We'd be ants. And so we, we have to make sure that we work to protect that. How about that? That's close to what you were just saying. Throughout all the writings of the early fathers, that's, that's a given. They don't even address it. They just write right past it. Because it's a known fact. The issue comes around every several hundred years, as predicted in Timothy, when people have an agenda that they want to force on a group of people. Uh, I don't know why man is so foul, but he is a foul creature. Uh, and, and he runs around looking for power because he, because he has never given his heart to the Lord, is, is the simple fact of it. Can you give me a power story? No. Okay, so give me, the, give me the description, give me the words again. Okay, so is fasting a part of the law? There are, there are fasting uh, times, but we don't live under the law. But, but don't get it twisted, that doesn't mean you can't choose to fast now for whatever reason you choose. I don't care if you want to go hungry. Don't get hangry. There's a difference. If you choose not to eat for a little while for whatever reason. How many of us have, have uh, if, you're an, if you're a man over 40, you have spent at least one evening where you have not eaten and went in the next day for a procedure we all fear? Okay. Uh, frequently when we go to a doctor, we don't eat the night prior, right? That's okay. You, you know, there's no prohibition against it. And there's no requirement to do it within the law that we are bound by. My only recommendation with, with people is, is be careful with it. You, you, you can do some damage to yourself if you fast too hard, too fast. How about that? That's us. That is the history of the Old West. Wrestling something to the ground and just biting on it. Sometimes not even taking the time to skin it, depending upon how hungry we were. It was tough times, right? Hard times in the desert. But it's us, right? If, if, I've heard that said. If you can kill it, you can eat it. That's right. Possums are the exception, right? If you kill a possum, burn it. Anything you got to cook three times. There's an art to possum cooking. If you ain't been shown it, don't try this at home. You're not going to have a good meal. And there are other animals like that. So, but that's who we are. Because we're a product of 16, 1700 years of reinforcement that we're not bound by the food laws. Whatever's out there, catch and eat. 
And we have no historical tie to Jewish culture. Specifically in America, I mean, we cut loose from the good and the bad of every culture when we set sail. We did bring baggage. We unpacked it here and been dealing with it ever since. Uh, but for the most part, we cut all of our tribal culture away until there were enough of us reassembled here that we could make our Chinatowns and our little Italy's and those kind of things. So, any other discussion about tradition? Can you? I don't know. Okay, let's. You could, you could bring that within context of the discussion, but you need to, you need to caveat it with, you know, we're going to come to this verse a lot because it's a, it's a broad brushstroke scripture about managing and maintaining behaviors. Know your reason why you do a thing. Have you ever met someone say that they wanted, something, they wanted to do something for the Lord and it was clearly self-serving? Yeah. Yoga ministries are like that. Why? I don't mean to point those out specifically, because there are others, but you know, I, I, I don't know that the Spirit calls you to perform that as much as you want to. All right, all those things. Are you ready? What are your preferences? Have you ever thought about your food preferences? You do, you do every night when somebody says, what do you want? Well, I don't know, what do you want? I don't know, what do you want? That's right. He likes to eat. He likes to. He likes to kill and eat birds and four-footed, four-legged animals. So, okay. How about that? There is nothing dirtier on the planet than a hot dog, bar none. That thing is all beaks and feet and necks and and all the stuff you broom off the meat floor and just push into a grinder. And I love them. I mean, is there any doubt in anybody's mind? I have asked the congregation to fund a hot dog truck. And you all disappointed me and said no and voted for a minister instead. I couldn't understand. I was lost for days, wandering through scripture. Right, so Hans is given credit. Hans is given credit to the to the German culture for for snossages. But I'll tell you that the first people to gut an animal and be left with an empty stomach thought I could stuff something in this. I mean, not ten steps out of the garden, Cain and Abel were arguing over what to grind up and put in the stomach of an animal. Is a person my personal opinion. From different parts of the world. Haggis and Menudo, and never did those cultures meet until modern times. So, how about that? Everybody know that guy? If you're a struggling American family, you've met that guy on a store shelf. He is dirty. There isn't anything clean in him. And this is because of the way we process our foods, and the way we wash them, and what we treat them with in order to keep them on the shelf forever and a day. And so he's happy to be in your home, but he is unclean. Ramen. If you don't know how much Ray Fuller likes ramen, it is second to hot dogs in the food chain. It's hot dogs, ramen, and then coffee. That's my food chain. And because, again, because of the way we package and process it, it's dirty. Can never be made clean, no matter what ingredients you, you throw in it to make it taste nice. So those are my preferences. None of them are clean. I would be sunk if you told me I had to live by the law. All you college students, 
What's the number one college prepared meal in a dorm room? Macaroni and cheese with ham cubes. None of which is clean. Doesn't matter how much salt and pepper you throw on it. Ramen is second, by the way, in climbing. So we're working on ramen becoming the most widely prepared meal in a college dorm. I need to purchase a couple of billboards and promote it. What else? What are, what are the rest of your food? What? Bacon. Wow, you just challenged American culture. Yeah, it's its own food group. It's up there with hot dogs and, and coffee. Where's chocolate? Yes, okay. Is chocolate clean? I never looked it up. Some parts of chocolate cannot be because of where they come out of before we process them. Same with coffee. So be careful with it. So, um, sashimi, unclean. What about sushi? Now, now sashimi is just the raw fish chunk. You're like, oh, it's fish. Sushi is the one they wrap in, in, in rice. So. so, there's the rule. Just because you can doesn't mean you have to. So, I can eat all those things, and I choose to. But it doesn't mean I have to. And I said it that way because we're going to reverse that also here in just a second, which might be more important in your discussion with some people. So uh, I don't normally pick on other groupings, but, but I, I'll make a joke at the expense of one for uh, a few seconds here. How do you know someone's a vegetarian? That's right. <laughs> where'd that come from? That's right. Just wait five minutes. They will tell you. And then they will advocate for it. Uh, because they seem compelled to, uh, because it's a minority position, uh, and, and we always, American culture is to support and fight for a minority position. That's why we supported Israel for so many years, and then when they started winning, we were like, it's not so much fun now. So they'll, they'll tell you, and they'll fight for it, and they'll advocate for it, and it's the advocation that you have to be careful for. It's like, whoa, dude, you, you can be that. I have no issue with you. Be that. But it, you can't make me. I'm going to go home and have a hot dog with some ramen. <laughs> Don't be a sinner. It's dirt. They think dirt's clean. But anyway, I agree. Did everyone hear the discussion? So I don't disagree with you, but just realize that, that we should, I'm going to say this poorly, and I don't mean it to be uh, misconstrued, but the, 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 the purpose of all of our conversations, sometimes hidden from view at first, but apparent later, is to talk to people about Christ. It doesn't mean every conversation has to go there and in there, but it does mean at some point someone should be... The goal is that people feel compelled one day to just say, why? So arguing with someone about that isn't great. What I tend to do is say, I appreciate you and you are free to do that, but please don't force your opinions on me because if I turned that on you, you would not appreciate me. So let's not. I know, I know. Yeah. No, no, you're good. You're good. You've had this discussion. It left a scar. <laughs> so, I don't know. When people tell me thou shalt not kill, I'm like, dude, I'm a soldier. What else am I going to do? Don't get in my way. And, and then they just kind of, they're like backing away a little bit, but... but yeah, 
I don't mess with my business of killing. Oh, stop it. Plants can scream, right? I'm so glad I don't have to hear it. I'm deaf to their cries. Um, that's the key. What you choose to do, you cannot make a requirement for others. Understanding the context is the purpose for which we exist, to bring others to Christ. And if you just go around leveling rules on people, you're standing alone, and there is no one to talk to. I guarantee it. There are plenty of rules in Scripture for you. Obey those. Obey those righteously, as God understands righteously, and be a light. It's not a difficult task to master, but it requires you to master self before you try to master others. That's the tough part. So those are my preferences. Any of you different with those? I know there's a hot dog hater out here somewhere. I can feel you. That's all right. Stay silent. <laughs> Sir. You, Gene is a hamburger guy. Yes, you are. So, remember, remember that this discussion is in and of itself a rabbit hole. The topic is the law. But sometimes we have to get people through these smaller discussions so that we can have the larger ones. And it's okay. You're not spinning your wheels having it. Just remember that they lead to a further larger discussion that we should be willing to have. And, and it all comes around to Christ's purpose, which those verses you guys pulled out were perfect because that explains it. So that's me. Tracy, go ahead. Have, have you ever made a hard right turn in your life? Now, I have a couple of, I have a couple of hard right turns in, in my life, and I wouldn't wish them on anyone. They're almost always emotional and traumatic. Um, but have you ever had your worldview just suddenly skewed and, and be left with no choice but to deal with the change? You couldn't fix it, and you couldn't change the change. It, it had already happened, and it was permanent. And you're just stuck there in a new world, and you're like, uh. your anchor is the Lord. And what Christ was trying to tell them and what Peter and Paul were trying to tell them is that when you anchor yourself on the resurrection, and you have proof and validation of your faith, then everything else should be accomplishable. But it's, you've got to have, got to have courage. Take heart, right? So I think that Scripture says I'm not bound by the food laws. My tradition and culture doesn't support adherence to it, and none of my preferences are to place myself under that yoke. So this is, again, one of those rare instances where all of them perfectly align in my sight picture, and I'm all in. I don't have any overlap or underlap. I don't know where you are. If you choose to adhere to some of them because you choose to do not blame the law do not attempt to turn scripture into a pretzel to support it that's heinous and it's foul but you should be equipped to have the conversation with people who are doing that to themselves to help any other comments questions sir Just because you can eat clean or unclean animals doesn't mean you have to. What you choose to do is require someone else. There's something like that. When you're down and things like that, you've got to remember, uh, Romans 4, 6, and 8, let your brother eat meat because of the food, there's no longer water in the water. We're calling that back to the So read that again. Yet if your brother eats meat because of the food, there are no longer water in the water. 
Okay, so Romans 14, 15. If your brother is grieved uh, by your food choices, then you're no longer walking in love. So remember the context of that. That is not a yoke placed upon me by you to force me to do what you want. Ever. Never. Nor is it an opportunity for you to control the behavior of others. Putting yourself under that yoke in the greater context of Romans 13 through 15 is a voluntary process. We started with that. That's how I support and train new Christians, by walking with them for a limited amount of time in, in their problem with them, showing them the faith and the strength to let it go, and then when they do, it's like releasing your child on a bike after taking off the training wheels. You're like, go! Because everybody needs to be brought along at a different pace and rate and speed, right? Depending upon our, comp uh, our comprehension of Scripture and our understanding of our position within it. So thank you for bringing that up. But those do not do what people think they do in modern time. It's like the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I've just made Jesus a superpower. Instead of understanding that what the scripture really means in context is, I can do nothing unless Christ is with me. Okay. All right, I yield back two minutes of your time. Next week... Uh, we will talk about tithing. So, study scripture on it. Come ready to participate, and we'll see where we go. Thank you for your time.